All righty. Well, I'm glad to be here tonight. I'm glad all of you came out for the revival meeting and appreciate everybody uh, bringing your friends, your family out. And I've sure enjoyed myself. It's been good to kind of just get, uh, you know, get to see Brother Brandenburg and his family again. We go back such a long ways and, and really I've just been uh, really blessed to get to have this time of fellowship with him and to get to meet you. And I just believe uh, there's some great, great things that God's going to do here. And I uh, just want you to be a part of all of it. Amen. Uh, God loves this church. Amen. And the church is not the building. Amen. I'm not talking about a building. The church is the people. Amen. And uh, we're going to dismiss here in just a minute. And the Cross Point Baptist Church is going to be uh, disbanded, really. It's, gonna, it's going to not be gathered together. And, uh, but the building's going to stay here, but the church will be assembled back together and uh, for Sunday for worship and preaching. And boy, that's what God loves. Amen. As a matter of fact, He purchased it with His own blood. So thank you for the chance to be here with me, uh, with you, preacher. I appreciate it very much. And I haven't said anything about it. I talked to the preacher yesterday, and he said, go ahead and let the folks know. But I do have a, uh, the Lord has uh, really uh, given me the privilege to operate a gospel radio station. And I love radio. I love everything about it. It's the missionary that never sleeps. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Man, we are going into the homes of north central West Virginia and into pickups and big old semi-trucks, cars. We've got a regional jail just to the west of us. Our signal reaches into the jail. We've got a medium, a medium security prison to the, to the east of us. Uh, and we reach into that prison. We are able to purchase a translator station two years ago over in Clarksburg. A lot of Roman Catholics live there. Folks don't think that uh, they don't think about the Italians in West Virginia, but we got a lot of Italians in West Virginia. They came over to work in the coal mines, and man, all the you know, our, a lot of politicians, man, they're Manconis and Angonis and Mancinis and Papaginis and all kinds of names like that. So. Uh, uh, man, a lot of Roman Catholics there, and, uh, and we just want to have a chance to reach them for the Lord. Amen? I have a newsletter that I send out a couple of times a year. I call it the Armor, and I'll have some on the back back there if you want to stop by and pick up one. I put an article in there every time. My associate uh, that helps with the station, Brother John Slayball, writes an article. My wife always puts something in there. And then this one happens to be talking about the uh, share that we just finished up on the first week of April. We raise funds for the radio station with our listeners, a listener portion of the budget. And, uh, boy, God's been very good to us. We raise about $60,000 a year. That's just the listener portion of the budget through our listeners. And uh, we uh, take uh, the first six months and we raise the funding. And we ask for 183 sponsors at $150 a day. And uh, to God be the glory, we were able to reach our goal again this spring. And uh, when we come to the first week of October, we'll have another share with the touch of the Lord. We'll raise uh, another 183 days of sponsorship. It takes more than that to run the station, but we have some churches that support. We have some broadcasters that support. We don't send out any bills to preachers. And uh, we're a faith operation. I, I, my whole ministry has been run by faith all of my life. So we just do it that way. If I have a broadcaster come on, I send it him a letter like I do all of them saying I want you to come but your support is not uh, dependent upon whether you get to go on the station or not. If I want you here, I want you here. But I do want you to pray about supporting the station. Some of them do, some of them don't. But that's the way we do it. And the radio is an amazing thing, really. It's just amazing. I remember a couple of uh, years ago in the, in, the, in the heat of when all the, you know, we've got a lot of drilling for uh, gas and uh, mainly gas, natural gas up in north, north central West Virginia. There's just, uh, we're, we're past it when the gas prices went down. It shut down a lot of it, but there's still a lot going on. And uh, I remember we had uh, some men call from a drill site up in, in Ohio. And God knows all them folks up in Ohio need to be saved. That's right. Amen. And uh, didn't get any amens on the front row there. Amen. But anyway... Some guys operating a big drill rig somewhere in Ohio, right straight north of us. And they said, we've got to, we're listening to some good preaching right here in the main drill room. And man, those guys were listening to some preaching. And they said, they called in and said, one of the workers came in cussing up a blue streak, 
heard that preaching, shut his mouth, turned around, and walked out. Amen? <laughs> so I thought that was neat. Amen? At least we, cuss, we shut one cusser up for a little bit and uh, had just a great time there. The stories, you know, when our share when they when we have them, we get to hear from our listeners. And with every phone call, every time somebody calls and says, you know, I want to give a widow's mite offering or I want to give a $20 offering or I want to be a day sponsorship, there's always a story behind uh, every phone call about what the radio station has done in their life. And I just absolutely love it. I've been a broadcaster now for 20 years. And uh, this coming July, we'll celebrate our fifth anniversary. And uh, just really, I'm going to get Brother Brandenburg down there sometime and do some radio preaching for us. Definitely, he's got a face for radio. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I just had to say that. Amen. <laughs> yeah, here we go. with my love off it. Amen. Oh, I was just kidding, preacher. Amen. You got a face for television. Amen. And um, and then really pick up one of the newsletters and then stop by and pick up one of our prayer cards and pray for the radio station. And uh, we do uh, stream on the internet, wvgvradio.com, WV like West Virginia, GV like Gospel Voice, radio.com. And if you want to listen to us online, and I even have a platform where you can dial a number. You know, some of the old timers here, you know, the young ones, they know all about apps and downloading apps and using them, stuff like that for tablets and pods and pads and peanuts and whatever else there is to use. But old timers, they don't mess with apps, but uh, I have a phone number that you can dial. And if you dial that phone number, it connects you to our streaming service so you can listen to the radio by way of telephone. That's kind of neat. We, a lot of times we'll have uh, missionaries that we're interviewing and people, their families and friends want to hear those interviews so they'll just dial that, uh, that phone number and listen for, you know, 30 minutes or so of the interview and get to hear their children sing or somebody testify or preach. It's just a neat thing there. So please, after the service, come by and pick up one of my prayer cards, pick up one of those uh, newsletters, and remember to pray for us. Amen. Amen. We're just trying to do our part to reach our part of the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that our time is so limited if we just were able to look and know for sure, it would probably put fear in each and every one of us to know how short our time is. If you ever, ever planned to love the Lord and serve the Lord uh, and be saved, you need to do it now. We just really don't know, uh, really, uh, how much time that we have left. And while I'm talking about that, let's go ahead and take our Bibles tonight and look to the New Testament book of Matthew and we're going to look at the 24th chapter. I'm glad to have Riley over here, Riley Featherstone. Doesn't that sound like an Indian's name, Featherstone? But actually it's British, amen. And he has come visiting us tonight. He's a young evangelist. And he was talking to the pastor and I. And I want you to pray for him, amen. It is a, it's always a, like an uphill battle to get started in evangelism with revival meetings and get your ministry going and and I believe he loves souls. I believe that he comes from a very good church. And uh, I believe that God could use him in a very special way. Who knows? Maybe God is going to use Riley Featherstone to shake Canada and America uh, for the cause of Christ. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Amen. So you jot him down on your prayer list and pray for him. Well, we need evangelists. It's a, not a very easy, it's a very difficult field just because of the, um, you know, the obstacles that comes along with it. But... Boy, I wouldn't want to do anything else in the world. Amen. I just appreciate what God's called me to do. Well, have you found Matthew chapter 24? Well, you have to wait a minute while I find it, all right? Won't you go ahead and stand to your feet as we read this passage here tonight, Matthew chapter number 24. And we're going to look down to, let's see here, start with verse number. Oh, let's see here. Why don't we go ahead and start with, um, with verse number 36. Let me read the passage to you. Follow along in your Bibles. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming 
of the Son of Man be? Just those verses tell us that when Jesus comes back in the rapture, that everybody's going to be so busy and it's just going to take people by absolute surprise. Look at the next verses. Verse number 40. Then shall two be in the field, and one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. You ever heard of the old time preacher by the name of Mays Jackson? Anybody ever heard of Mays Jackson? Mays Jackson used to say, two people shall be watching TV and both of them shall be left. Amen? But anyway, all right. I didn't say that. Brother Mays did. He'll get mad at him, all right? And look at verse number 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would have come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? I want to draw your attention tonight to verse number 44. Notice once again, Therefore be also ready, for, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Cometh. Let's go ahead and bow for prayer, shall we? Can I get just a little bit of volume on this cordless mic, please? Thank you very much. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we come now so thankful and grateful for this incredible privilege that you've given us to assemble here tonight. Lord, it all be in vain unless the Holy Ghost of God comes and blesses us with His presence and conviction tonight. We know, Lord, that it's not by accident that we're all here tonight. By your divine, sovereign providence, Lord, you've led us here tonight. And we pray now, Lord, that you'll do a great spiritual work in each and every one of us. We pray, Lord, for the salvation of the lost. We pray, dear God, for the restoration of the backslider. We've been praying, dear God, for revival for the church. Lord, please work in a real sweet, special way tonight. We pray, dear God, that you'd just send us a refreshing. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you so much for standing with me. You know, according to the Scriptures, the Lord Jesus Christ one day is going to call all true believers out of this sin-sick, hell-bent world one day, and I believe it's going to be soon. And I believe that we are all witnessing we're witnessing the consequences of what uh, many called postmodernism upon our culture. When you hear the term postmodernism used on the television or on any secular or in any Christian radio, uh, some kind of a broadcast, you have to know what they're saying. Postmodernism simply means we have gone, we have gone beyond believing that the Bible is the Word of God. When they use the word postmodernism, it means that our culture no longer looks at the Bible as being the authority, God's authority for all of mankind. So when that phrase postmodernism is used, uh, that's what it means. It means that we believe, no longer believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired, infallible, preserved Word of God. But those of us that know the truth, we know that God's Word is true. Amen. Amen. God promised that He was going to preserve His Word. And He didn't leave that task to anyone but Himself. He said, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. But I believe what we see, see, what we see taking place, especially right now in America especially with the elections and all that's going on, we are seeing the consequences of a postmodern postmodernism upon our culture and upon all professing Christianity. And they should all be signs to us. And our reaction to this drastic shift ought to be to be ready, to be prepared. The Bible says in our text passage, Therefore be also ready... 
For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. And uh, listen, it is uh, so important for us to grasp this thought. So in the context of this passage here, we are admonished to be ready. It means to be prepared. It means to be prepared to meet our wonderful Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore be also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. On this very thought of being ready, being prepared, uh, several years ago I began to notice uh, billboards. Uh, a certain advertisement that I saw upon billboards all over America. I began to see this, uh, this, ad, uh, this ad campaign in newspapers and billboards and magazines and newspaper ads. I began to hear about this campaign, this ad campaign, about uh, encouraging the American population to be ready. I began to hear it on radio and television, commercials encouraging the public to be prepared in the event of a local or a regional or possibly a national disaster. And uh, the ad, uh, the campaign was uh, an attempt to encourage uh, the American population to be ready for anything from a hurricane to a flood to an earthquake to a wildfire to tornadoes to home fire to blackouts to pandemics to biological chemical threats all with a campaign called ready.gov. It was initiated by the United States federal government, the Ad Council and FEMA the Federal Emergency Management Agency, encouraging the entire American population to be ready in the event that some national disaster were to occur, that you would have some supplies ready, that you would have some water, that you would have some medical supplies, that you would have the the, the medicines that you need, uh, a supply of meds in the event of an emergency that you can take care of your family. I mean, they tell us even today, uh, you cannot expect the emergency squad or even the police or the fire or the first responders because if something big happens, they're going to be so busy taking care of, of the masses that you're going to have to be able to take care of yourself and your family. Well, as a husband and a father, I think it's my responsibility to be ready. I mean, I think it's my responsibility to have some food. I think it's my responsibility to make sure that we have some kind of a communication. I think it's my responsibility to know that we have a radio, battery operated radio, where we can get information. I think it's my response. I don't think that I have to depend on everyone else to do my part. So in, in ways we have tried to prepare for that. And you know, with the radio station, we began to receive uh, these public service announcements from the Ad Council, from FEMA, encouraging families to prepare by gathering emergency supplies, by making a family plan, by discussing emergency notifications and expectations. One of the very first things, uh, first preparation to develop is a communication plan. I mean, listen, you can go onto that website tonight after church and you can validate what I'm telling telling you tonight is all absolutely true. You see, your family may not be together when a disaster or a storm hits. So it is important to know how you're going to get in contact with one another in the event of an emergency. And how you're going to get back together when it's safe to travel again. And how is your family going to get these emergency alerts and emergency warnings? And how is your family going to get to a safe location for relevant emergencies? And how will your family get in touch if there's no cell phone, if there's no internet, if there's no landline service, if it doesn't work? How in the world are you going to even let your family know? So they say, get those preparations done now before the storm comes. And I think that's correct. I think that's the right way to be. As a matter of fact, that's kind of what Jesus was saying in this passage there. Here. 
Therefore be also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. I'm looking at folks right now. now listen, you have made no preparations. You haven't made preparation for a storm, much less when you see Jesus face to face. You have been playing games with Christianity for so many years. And you haven't made any preparations to look God face to face. The Bible says, therefore be also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now I, fo- I know folks don't like this kind of preaching. Go ahead and go to the liberal p- the churches with the guys that are going to wear a, a, a lace on their underwear and they'll never get you ready to see God. All they want to do is just entertain you. Get you to clap your hands a while, listen to a bunch of nonsense rock and roll music. And they'll never warn you about eternity. Well, Jesus said, therefore be also ready. For in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Listen, we have to be ready. This is all part of of being ready, being prepared. But my friend, more important than these physical preparations for a storm or for for some kind of an event, some kind of a dreadful event that could take place. Listen, it's more important to be spiritual ready. Amen. The spiritual preparations far exceed in importance because the spiritual readiness extends to eternity. You know, as a, uh, we have a, our full power radio station, 89.7, out of West Union, West Virginia. It's our full power station. The station over in Clarksburg is a translator station. It picks it up off the air. What we broadcast on 89.7, there's just a simple antenna that picks up the 89.7 signal and it rebroadcasts it on the 96.7 signal. And you know that we have to have a machine called the EAS system, Emergency Alert System. I have to have three systems that come into that, two that come off of an FM station that is tied in with uh, this Emergency Alert System, and then I have to have a professional radio, weather radio that taps into this. And at the uh, sound of a tone, that machine initiates and it overrides all of my programming. It can be done by Washington, D.C. When you hear those tests, that's what it's all about. And they're now doing tests. They're doing them on a weekly basis now. They're doing them on a monthly basis with uh, with a uh, section of the country. Uh, In the month of September, every radio station has to be in compliance. You have to register for it. You have to show proof that your station broadcast it. My, all of my software, internal IP codes will register when the signal came in from one of those stations or the weather radio, and then when it went out, it's all registered. I have to journal that, and the FCC is good. They're trying. They've been trying for several years to get it. It used to be the emergency broadcasting system, but it's not that anymore. It's the EAS system. And every station is required to have that, whether it's an LP station, a low power, an FM, or an AM. And at the flick of a switch, the federal government can take over every single radio station. Sounds to me like they're they're trying to get us ready. And that's what I'm trying to do. You see, the spiritual readiness extends to eternity. Therefore, be also ready. For in such an hour as you think not... The Son of Man cometh. He says in Luke chapter 12, verse 40, Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. You see, the duty to watch is not to sit up on a housetop and watch for Christ, but watch ourselves to see whether we are ready for His return. Luke chapter 21, verse 34, listen to these verses. And take heed to yourselves. Lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man." 
Therefore be also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. I want to give you three challenges tonight. Number one, here it is. The Bible says in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. Here's the point. Number one, ready dot answer. Every single one of us who are true, blood-washed, born-again believers, every one of us ought to be able to give an answer of the hope that lies within us. Every single one of us should get to the point where we can take a Bible or a track or our own testimony and show someone how to be saved. Some, there's going to be some grandparents that you have the opportunity to win your grandchild, or win your great-grandchild to Christ, but you don't have any spirituality about you, and you're going to let them die and go to hell. You know why? You're not ready. God says every single one of us that are blood washed, we ought to be ready. Man, you have been coming to church for how long? How long have you been coming to church? You don't know how to win a soul to Jesus Christ? You know how a good way to start is, listen, why, listen, the next time you have, just talk about it tonight and plan it. Husband, practice on leading your wife to Christ. And then wife, Practice on leading your husband to Christ. And practice on leading your children to Christ. And have your children practice on leading you to Christ. That is the way you gain confidence. You have to do it to gain that confidence. Amen. But the point is we have to be ready to give an answer. There are people that would be saved. They want to be saved. They know they need to be saved. But nobody talks to them about it. Be ready to give an answer. Ready, dot, answer. God says all of us are supposed to be able to do it. If we're saved, be ready to show somebody how to be saved. How to know Christ as their Savior. Amen. Asketh you a reason of the hope. Amen. We need to know how to communicate the gospel. Amen. Using a Bible, using a New Testament, using a gospel tract. And if you don't have a Bible with you, and you don't have a New Testament with you, and you don't have a Bible with you, then commit them to memory. Memorize the plan of salvation. If you have a hard time memorizing, all you need is to tell them how you got saved, and that's enough to show somebody else how to be saved. I was preaching a revival meeting over in uh, eastern West Virginia in the uh, Harper's Ferry area. And uh, my wife's cousin had moved out that way, got a good job with an electrical company. He, and he, is, uh, he was a Marine, and he met uh, his wife. She was a Marine. They got married, had a beautiful house built. They had already invited us to come and see their house when I was nearby, and I was close. And I'd, rem I'd remembered a couple of times I felt like I needed a witness to Pam and I, don't, I didn't feel like I was aggressive enough like I should have been. And I was going to be over there and they had this new house. They invited me to see it. And I just felt like the Lord was just dealing with my heart. Oliver, you need to go. You need to go over there and you need to show her how to be saved. You need to show Pam how to be saved. And man, I was under conviction about it. So I called Jay and I left him a message and he called me back and he said, man, listen, why don't we we'll plan for this night? My wife will have supper for you and we'll get to show you the house. We'd love to do that. I said, all right, Jay, I'll be there. And man, I found the address, put in my GPS, drove over there. And she had a delicious meal prepared, beautiful house that they had built. He's just always such a nice guy, served our country in the Marine Corps. His wife, you know, she's a Marine and just wonderful time. And then we finished supper. And then the kids very politely and obediently left the table, went into the living room, and they started watching some cartoons. I mean, it was just like the Lord was setting this up for me to witness. We had some small talk. I couldn't find any way to just move the conversation into the plan of salvation. And I knew if I was going to witness this woman here, I was going to have to just simply confront her with the gospel. I was going to have to ask her about her salvation, about her soul. I could, there was no way, and I was running out of time. So if it was going to get done, I was going to have to confront her. So I looked right at her and I said, Pam, I want to ask you a question. 
I said, Pam, do you know, Pam, that you're going to go to heaven when you die? Do you know what it means to be saved? She said, I don't know. I said, Pam, I want to show you what the Bible says about being saved. My testament was in my coat pocket, and I didn't feel like I could go get it because that would be just some time lapse there. So I quoted the Bible verses to her, and I showed her how to be saved. And I, the last verse was Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, where the Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, Jesus said, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I said, Pam, Jesus didn't say I might come in or I could come in, but he said, I will come in. I said, Pam, if you were to ask Jesus to come into your heart and be your Savior, will he do it? She said, yes. I said, would you like to do it? She said, yes, I would. And she sweetly called upon Jesus to be her Savior. I called a church in Martinsburg, West Virginia, told them what had happened. I said, I led her to the Lord. I want you to follow up with a visit. And they did. They didn't get plugged into that church, but they got plugged into what's called the Independent Bible Church. And uh, I can't remember the name of the town there in eastern West Virginia. And about uh, two or three months later, I got a letter. I was out preaching a revival meeting. My wife, Kim, she said, sweetheart, uh, she said, uh, you got a letter today. She said, you got a letter from Pam. I said, well, read it to me, sweetheart. She says, no, I'm not going to read it to you. You need to read it when you get home. I said, just read it to me now. I want to know what it says. She says, I'm not going to read it to you. you got to read it for yourself when you get home. I said, all right. Well, I got home a couple of days later, and she had cooked me my, my favorite meal, and we had, you know, just a family time, and then I was just kind of relaxed, and I'd been busy and had on the revival trail. It was in the wintertime. And uh, she, she said, here, I want you to read that letter. Sit over in your chair and read that letter. And I read that letter, and it was fascinating to me. She said, you know, she said, uh, Oliver, she said, when my, my husband and I, Jay and I, had always argued about fate and faith. He had faith. Oh, by the way, after I finished winning Pam to the Lord, I looked over at Jay and I said, Jay, how about you, Jay? Have you ever been saved? That big old smile I mean, he looked too kind to be a Marine. I mean, big old smile, just smiling. He said, Oliver, don't you remember? I said, what, what do you mean, Jay? He said, you showed me how to be saved when I was just a teenager. And then I remembered. I said, well, praise the Lord, Jay. I, I remember now. Well, anyway, she, back to that letter. She said, Jay and I always argued. I believed in fate. Things just happened because they happened. And he believed in faith. He said, I he, she, the only, only church service I'd ever gone to was a wedding. She said, I couldn't ever remember one single time when I felt like God, if there was a God, reached out to me. He said, but then you came to our house. And she said, and after you finished eating your meal and the kids left, she said, you looked right at me and you asked me that question. She said, it was like Jay wasn't even in the room. You asked me that question, and she said, and I knew instantly that God was reaching out to me. She says, I'm going to get baptized, and I want you and Kim and the kids to come and witness my baptism. Well, I had that date booked, and I couldn't go, but my wife and my children went, and they got to see Pam baptized. Folks, be you ready. For in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh, ready dot answer. Every single one of us need to know how to communicate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be the only one that can lead your son to the Lord or your daughter to the Lord. You may be the only one that, uh, listen, you, listen, it might be a grandchild here that wins a grandparent to the Lord, a grandmother, a grandfather, an aunt or uncle. Oh, listen, I'm telling you, Jesus is coming. We look at this world and there's just a sense. There is just a feeling. Everybody is concerned about it. Everybody knows that the direction of this nation, there's something wrong about this. And there's a stirring about it. Oh, listen, good, good night. We've got to be ready. We have to be we're able to answer the, uh, the reason, the hope that is in us. Tell about heaven, uh, about heaven. Amen. And listen, when we go through the problems of life, Listen, every one of us are going to go through problems. There are people going to suffer cancer. They're going to suffer sickness. They're going to suffer divorce. They're going to suffer horrible things in life. And listen, when you go through those hard times, 
people are watching you. And when they go through those hard times, they don't call their drinking buddies. They're going to call the Christian for help. And you can, give, you can be there to give an answer of taking and going through the problems of life. Be ready to give an answer of the hope that is in us. Amen. On why we trust the Bible and why all the human suffering. Give the answers with meekness and fear. It's what the Word of God says. Therefore be also ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. Number two. Number one, ready dot answer. Number two, ready dot rapture. The Bible says this, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light. And the children of the day, we are not of the night, nor of the darkness. I'm telling you, my friends, the Lord Jesus is coming back. If you know anything about the Word of God, we know that, that the rapture is on, the, on, the, on God's schedule to take place. And from that point, this world is going to go into a time of tribulation when all true blood-washed, born-again believers are going to go out of this world. And it's going to come under the rule of the Antichrist. And there's going to be a one world government and a one world church and a one world, uh, one world money system. And folks, we are headed in that direction. It is absolutely amazing. And there is no doubt that Google, companies like Google and Apple are going to be big players with identifying. I watched a, a program just the other day that a, an American reporter went to another country and got himself microchipped. They have been using it in the military for years. They have been using it in animals. Listen, when they microchip uh, animals, they can detect when there's some kind of a disease or something that comes. They can detect the very place where it comes from and they can attack it at the source. Oh, listen, it's absolutely amazing what is taking place. It's called the Internet of Things. Everything is going to be wound together. Bluetooth technology, wireless uh, uh, visual implants. I mean, we are headed that way. I don't even have the time to go into it tonight. The rapture is going to take place. And we have got to be ready. And if you're going to be ready for the rapture, number one, you've got to be right with God. If you're going to be ready for the rapture, you have to be right with your church. The Bible says that we are not to forsake this symbol. Listen, a, a Christian at a church is like a fish out of water. We're just going to flop on the bank and dry up and be of no use. Amen. we got to be in the house of God. Amen. Man, that's where we come to get our batteries charged up. we got to be right with God. We have to be right with our church. Uh, amen. We have to be right with our friends and our families and even our foes. You know, I've been preaching long enough now to when I go into a church, man, I, I have felt tension sometimes. I mean tension. I've been involved in what I'm doing right now since I was 14 years old. I've been a full-time evangelist now for 34 years. I have preached in all kinds of churches all over America and all over the world. And I have walked in churches and I can feel tension. I mean, you can walk in a church and you can feel tension. My, man, what is it about the people on that pew? What is, why do, why do I, that, that um, feeling is coming from that group? Oh, I'm telling you, life is too short to go through it with ill feelings of our brothers and sisters in the Lord and even with our children. Amen. I'm talking about adult brothers and sisters. Get right with your family. Get right with your family. Amen. Get right with your family. Somebody has always has to initiate it. Number one, ready dot answer. Number two, ready dot rapture. And then last of all, look with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 17. The Bible says in this passage here, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. 
Number three, ready dot judgment. You know, one day, friend, one day all of us are going to stand before the creator of heaven and earth. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He is holy and He's just. And when we stand before Him and give an account for ourselves, we are either going to stand before Him on our own merit or on the merit of His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And your decision down here determines how you're going to stand before Him up there. And once you stand before the Lord, there's going to be no opportunity to change anything. The decision to be saved has got to be right here. It has to be a decision by faith. Amen. By faith. By faith. It has to be a decision by faith. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How do we know that? We believe it by faith. The Bible says, For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Ready dot judgment. My, I grew up in the suburbs of Dallas in a little town called Mesquite. My dad worked real hard and he saved up his money and he bought a beautiful little 10-acre hobby farm about 30 miles southeast of Dallas in a little town called Kaufman, Kaufman, Texas. When you drove into Kaufman County, it said, Beware, you're, you're entering lion country. We were the Kaufman Lions. I played, got to play a junior high football there in Kaufman. It's a great place for a boy to grow up on. We had horses, cows, chickens, and pigs. I mean, we just had it all. Just a wonderful place to grow up on. And uh, in, that, in the front yard of that old farmhouse was a big old giant cedar tree. And my dad uh, had a big old heavy-duty rope, and he threw it on a big limb that came out, and he tied a tire on the end of that rope there and made an old-fashioned, old-timey tire swing. How many of you have ever swung on an old tire swing? Hold up your hind legs. I mean your hands, all right? <laughs> Amen. Man, batters are not included. Amen. Just nothing but fun. And me and my brothers, my two brothers, Larry and Daniel, and my sisters, Dora and Linda and Lisa, we created a game. The game that we created was, who was the first to see Dad's truck? That was the game. The boys against the girls. Who was the first one to see Dad's truck? My dad, back in those days, drove an old, I think it was a 65 Chevrolet flatbed one-ton, old 292, six-cylinder, had a straight pipe. Just a great old work truck. And uh, man, when dad had pulled off of uh, 1641 on the Post Oak Bend Road there in Kaufman County, man, every now and then we could hear him rack them pipes. Uh, most of the time he didn't, but boy, it created a dust storm, especially on a hot Texas summer day. And the game was we'd look down the road, we'd see when the dust would billow up, and we'd want to see if it was dad's truck. Whoever saw his truck first was the winner. A lot of time we'd try to make it to the tire because you could swing up high and look further down the road. And most of the time, whoever got the tire swing won the game. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. Every night we had supper at the house. About every single night she'd make for us a homemade tortillas. And man, we'd go in the kitchen, you know, and we'd say, Mama, when's Dad going to be home? And she, her answer was always, he's probably coming right now. You better go see. That was her way to get us out of the kitchen. Sometime we'd divert her attention and we'd steal a, we'd steal a couple of, of uh, tortillas, amen, and we'd gobble them things up. Man, they're just so delicious. Boy, we'd be out there and we'd see that dust billow up and we'd think, man, that's dad. That's got to be him. That's got to be him. And it'd be a neighbor. We'd always wave. Man, you get in these big suburbs like Detroit, you're afraid to wave. Somebody might start shooting. And, uh, hey, man, somebody else would go by and we'd, man, is that him? Is that him? It'd be somebody else. We'd just wave. And then when we'd see that dust billow up and somebody would be up on that tire, that's him, that's him. Man, you thought that we hadn't seen him in months. He'd come down the road, pull in the driveway. We'd barely let him get out of the truck and there'd be arms around him from his ankle to his waist. Daddy was home. 
You folks, in these years, we have seen the dust billow up. We've seen things take place in the world. And I remember men saying, He's coming, He's coming. Here's the date, He's coming. Nobody knows the date nor the hour. You remember that man, Harold Camping? Had all them, all them, he got radio stations all over the world. He gave a time, a day when the rapture was going to take place. I remember some of my friends called him and said, Man, if the rapture is going to take place and you know about it, then give me one of them stations. You don't have any use for it. He didn't give one away. <laughs> and that day came and gone. Folks, no man knows the day nor the hour. We can know the times and seasons, but nobody knows the day nor the hour. I remember way back in 1988, there was a man by the name of Wisenot that wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in September of 1988. That's like ancient history now. 1988? Nobody knows the day nor the hour. What I'm saying is we've seen the dust billow up. And we thought it was our Savior, but it was something else. But I promise you, there's coming a day. Jesus is coming back. <laughs> he is coming back. And he says, therefore be also ready for in such an hour that you think not the Son of Man cometh ready dot answer, ready dot rapture, and ready dot judgment. Dear friend, look at me. One day you will stand before a holy, righteous God, the one that spoke the worlds into existence. Right. Listen to me now. And you are going to give an account. And if you stand before Him in your own merit, you're in trouble. If you've come to a day and time when you realize that you're a lost sinner before God and you believe that Jesus is His only begotten Son, that He died and rose again for your sins, and you put all of your faith and trust in Him, then you stand in the merit of Jesus Christ and you get to go to heaven. But if you don't, prepare for judgment. Ready dot judgment. Therefore be also ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. My friend, be ready. Be ready. Be concerned about your house. Should you stack away some groceries? Sure. Some water? Sure. A way to purify water? Sure. I have all of those things prepared. Some ammunition? You, sure, I've got some ammunition. All of that stuff. I can take care of my family. But listen, folks, that's just this earth. That's just going to pass away. We better make sure that we are prepared spiritually for our family because that's what goes into eternity. Now I want us to bow our heads for prayer, shall we? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Let's all stand together. Can I ask you to do that? Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Thank you. You listened so well tonight. You were just a, really a, a blessing to preach to. Now with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder how many of you tonight could could give an honest testimony. I'm not talking about faking it. An honest testimony. You say, preacher, I'm saved. I'm born again. I know heaven is my eternal home. I'm prepared. My soul is prepared for eternity. I'm saved. You know it for sure. Hold your hand up as a testimony. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. If you're happy to be saved tonight, how about a good hearty amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Now, while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, would there be anybody here tonight you'd say, Preacher, pray for me. I couldn't raise my hand. Or maybe you raised it reluctantly. Don't lie about this. The Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. Don't lie about being saved. Be honest with yourself. God will save you if you'll ask Him to. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many would say, Preacher, pray for me. I don't know for sure that I'm going to heaven when I die. I need to be saved and I want to be saved and I believe God's speaking to my heart about it. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand up right now and let me pray for you? God bless you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. Thank you so much. God bless you. Is there anybody else like that tonight? Let me pray for you. All right. Now, while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm going to ask Pastor Brandenburg to stand here right on the floor level. 
And while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm just going to try to help you. You're not going to have to say anything in public. I just want to get somebody with you to help you. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask these two precious souls that raise their hand. Would you be so kind to look at me for just a minute? Would you look at me? Thank you so much, ma'am. Would you just slip right here and meet the preacher right here? He's going to have a lady take the Bible and show you how to be saved. That's right. God bless you. Come on. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder tonight how many say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm ready for the rapture because I'm saved. But there's some things in my home spiritually that need some attention. And boy, God spoke to my heart this morning. I really need to get serious with the Lord. I need to get serious with the Lord. Pray for me. Could I see your hand? Would you lift it up real high? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you so much. Go ahead and put your hands down. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Brother Oliver, pray for me. Uh, I can remember a time when I was efficient in winning people to Christ. But it's been a long time. Preacher, would you pray for me that God would give me a burden for souls and then help me to find opportunities to win souls? I want to be ready to give an answer. I want a burden for souls and I want to win souls. Pray for me. Could I see your hand? Would you lift it up high? God bless you. Thank you so much. Amen. 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 Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Others would say, Brother Oliver, pray for me. We've got some issues that we're dealing with in our home. You know, the Bible talks about if we would have known that the enemies come in, we would have had our house in order. And a lot of times we've been so unfaithful to the Lord, our houses are not in order. And we're suffering the consequences of it with our children, grandchildren, a lot of fighting and just a lot of sadness. So you got to do what's right to, to get it right. How many say, Brother Oliver, pray for me. My home needs some prayer. Could I see your hand? Would you lift it up real high? Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the Lord's blessing on the invitation, but before we go to prayer, all of you that raise your hand about these questions, would you lift your head up and look at me? Now let me ask you, do you believe that the Lord loves you? He loves you. Do you believe that He just really spoke to your heart tonight? He did, didn't He? Then right now, without any, any more lingering, why don't you just find a place at the altar? Come on, right now. Get to the nearest aisle inside, outside, and find a place at the altar. And man, let's just, let's just get right with the Lord tonight. Our Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We pray now that you'll bless this invitation, dear God. You've just done a sweet, sweet work in our hearts tonight. Lord, this is just so important. I just don't even think I could even make it, do it justice. It's just so important that we are prepared spiritually Please, Lord, those of us that lead homes and families, people look up to us. It's our responsibility to, to make an effort to get everybody ready for eternity. We know we can only do so much. But, Lord, we got to do our part. Please help us, Lord. Bless, Lord, the Cross Point Baptist Church, Brother Brandenburg, as he leads it. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother John's going to sing for us. If you need to be saved and haven't come forward yet, you come tonight. We'll take the Bible and show you how to be saved.